So good morning, everybody. Um, it's a real privilege uh, mm. to be here amongst so many inspirational people. I know that word's been uh, used a lot this morning, so thank you very much indeed for uh, the invitation. It's also a pleasure to follow Robert. Um, he was actually my PhD supervisor back in the 1980s. Um, and uh, I once put a, a, um, a family tree of the academics in the field uh, in an international conference and said, Robert's sort of equi equivalent to my dad in the field. <laughs> but unfortunately, a few people came up at the end and said, oh, I didn't know Robert was your dad. Um, obviously, he's clearly not old enough to be my dad. So sorry about that, Robert. Anyway. Back to really important things, vaping. Um, and this is what I'm going to talk about. What we know about vaping, nicotine, how bad it is, and whether we should be striving for smoke-free or nicotine-free future. And then given the opportunities and challenges, what's the best regulatory framework for vaping? And how does vaping fit within the wider tobacco control context? So to start with, what do we know about vaping? We actually know quite a lot. Um, for me, these are the key issues um, that we need to grapple with in relation to uh, vaping. So uh, top left there, the health risks, and that can be broken down as in the box. What's happening with initiation and youth um, and never smokers? Smoking cessation, what effect does vaping have on smoking cessation in the top right box? And then health inequalities uh, on the bottom right. And I can't do justice to this in uh, the next uh, 20 minutes. Um, but I'll do my best to cover some key issues. Um, and what I'm drawing on here in particular are this series of um, six uh, reviews of the evidence that we've been commissioned to do over the years. Um, and as you can see there, the reports have different focuses each year. Every year we've tracked adult smoking and vaping and youth vaping and smoking, um, but we've also looked at different uh, issues. And it culminated in last year's big report on the health risks of vaping. And really, prior to the last couple of years, the population effects of vaping were all moving in the right direction. So there was evidence from multiple sources that people, were, people who smoke were attracted to vapes and they were helping them to stop smoking. And that included people from disadvantaged groups, which was really a first in our field, because usually we have to take people dragging and smoking to uh, the support. So I'm not going to say anything else about that. That evidence um, on disadvantage hasn't changed, but I'll come back to it at the end. And then secondly, uh, you've seen this graph already from Deborah and others, um, smoking prevalence among 11 to 15 year olds has been driving down in the last few years to the lowest level of 3% current smoking uh, prevalence. Um, and uh, vaping was initially quite stable, but uh, as we will hear, the last two years it has increased. But there's widespread misperceptions of the relative harms of smoking and vaping, and they have persisted. So again, I'm not going to say more about that, but please bear that in mind. Um, we do need to correct these widespread misperceptions. Okay, so what do we know about vaping? First, I'm going to look at the health risks, the subject of the uh, biggest report we've done um, last year. Um, and you can see all those chapters again on the different uh, components of the health risks, and I'll uh, just go through them quite quickly now. So the aims of that review were to look at both active and secondhand vaping and what impact it had, particularly on the risk of getting the three main killers from smoking, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, and cancers. And we were also interested to see, um, among people with existing health conditions, um, what were the effects of vaping on those disease outcomes. There wasn't very much evidence on there, but I think those studies are really important to do because we might see the impact of vaping much more quickly among people with existing health conditions. And where the data were available, we looked both at the relative risks, so what are the risks of vaping compared with smoking, and what are the risks of vaping compared with doing nothing. I'm not going to talk about dual use. It's a very heterogeneous um, uh, component because it varies from people just occasionally dabbling in both to da daily use and everything in between. Okay, so we identified uh, over 400 studies, which we went through systematically. Over nearly 300 were in humans, which is what I'll focus on uh, today. Now, you often hear people say, we don't know anything about the long-term health risks of vaping. That is it's not true, because in many areas of public health where we don't have the long-term data, we use what we call biomarkers, so they're intermediate indicators of harm. And there are two types of biomarkers that we looked at. The first, 
biomarkers of exposure, which is basically a measure of how much of various toxicants are going around the body. If you've got a lot of those toxicants, obviously that's going to be pretty dangerous. And we drew on the WHO um, biomarker list that they have, and there's some examples of them across the bottom. So what did we find? This is a pretty busy slide, so apologies for that, but the best way of trying to illustrate this, this is using data from meta-analyses, which is where you've got quite a few studies and you can synthesise them. So the uh, biomarkers here, some examples of them are down the left. The second column is vaping versus smoking. And what you can see in that column is quite a lot of green Durham wood arrows. So that basically translates to um, far fewer of these toxicants are in the bodies of people who vape compared with those in the bodies of people who smoke. There are some equal signs. So in that case, they were the same levels roughly. The final column is vaping versus non-use, and there you do see some red arrows which are up, which uh, indicate that there were higher levels um, of these biomarkers in people um, who were vaping compared with non-users. You also some, see some equal signs, meaning the toxicants were at the same levels in people who vaped compared with people who didn't use. And you'll see some equal signs across both columns, which suggests that vaping or smoking potentially isn't the main reason for that uh, biomarker. And then this is also complicated by long half-lives of some biomarkers. Um, sometimes the studies just looked at people who'd recently quit smoking, and of course they'd still have some of these toxicants flying around their bodies. So the top right there with the tobacco-specific nitrosamines, in the studies that had longer follow-ups, they were more likely to be similar to uh, non-users. So in summary, because um, I know that was very busy, we concluded that uh, toxicants were significantly lower among people who vaped than smoked. That's a really good thing. And they were similar or higher in some cases among people who vaped than non-users. And when we looked at the toxicants, which were specific to those three big diseases I talked about, the pattern was very similar. So significantly lower, vaping versus smoking, similar vaping versus non-use, although uh, they were higher in a few cases. So the second type of biomarker we looked at are biomarkers of potential harm. So these are objective medical signs in the body um, which um, start to perhaps look at the presence or progression of disease. Um, and again, we used a very bona fide um, set of biomarkers from the US uh, Food, uh, Food and Drug Administration. We looked at cross-cutting ones, and we um, have some examples there at the bottom, if it's not covered by the chair, so like blood pressure, compared with some more complicated ones in terms of the way genes are expressed. This was a much more heterogeneous literature. Um, we, we saw two when we looked at this in 2018. I think there was nearly 50 studies, so it's a rapidly growing literature. But basically, the studies weren't done in any consistent way. And this is something we're now striving for to try to get some international standards in vaping research for this kind of work. So it was very hard to synthesize the data. But in summary, uh, we said there was mixed evidence about the effects of these biomarkers of potential harm in relation to vaping. But there were no major red flags in the, in the literature. Um, there was nothing that was jumping out at us, at us as causes for concern. But if you, there was one study where they took a group of smokers and they switched them, no, let me get that right, they took a group of vapors and they switched them to smoking, which in my view is a little bit unethical. And there you did see some big jumps in some of these biomarkers, uh, su suggestive of smoking being much more harmful. In relation to secondhand smoke, um, secondhand vape exposure, there weren't a lot of studies. Um, we only identified six, and two were done in vape conventions where there was lots of heavy vaping going on, um, so they were atypically high levels of vaping emissions. Um, but for the ones that uh, didn't do that, the acute secondhand exposure to vaping resulted in non-significant changes in the toxicants among people who were uh, non-smokers or non-users. Um, however, I would say it's much better if you don't smoke uh, vape it's obviously better not to smoke around people, but it would also be good not to vape around people as well if you can avoid it. Okay, I'm just not going to go into the details of these, but you often see it's sort of slightly died down now about poisonings and explosions. These are very, very rare occurrences, but they are serious when they uh, occur, but they are very rare. And then fires, and I'm afraid this is just London. We did an FOI and got some um, details on the fires, but I think that picture is pretty stark, and we've already heard uh, fires mentioned uh, this morning as one of the killers 
um, as well as costs as well uh, to people. So overall, we uh, concluded vaping poses only a small fraction of the risks of smoking in the short to medium term. We don't have the very long-term follow-up data. The longer study was five years, and that showed a very similar pattern. But vaping is not risk-free, particularly for people who've never smoked. And as I've said, there were some methodological limitations. I'm just going to briefly go on to adult smoking cessation. So this slide is from the smoking toolkit. And this shows really that before we were even getting to grips with this research, smokers were choosing vapes as a means of stopping smoking in a way that we hadn't seen before. And it's now the most popular form of support after doing nothing. Um, and the good news is that when we've triangulated data from Cochrane, from the Stop Smoking Services, from other researchers, you do get a consistent pattern that vape, vapes help uh, smokers to stop smoking. Um, and this is the conclusion of the latest Cochrane review. There's high certainty evidence that e-cigarettes with nicotine increase quit rates compared to nicotine replacement therapy, which is a proven effective treatment for stopping smoking. And just wanted to say, we've heard about the smoking cessation services, um, and I just wanted to show this slide. You can see that the most popular forms of support are combination NRT and varenicline, which of course is no longer available. Um, and you can see vaping products are very few of um, the quit attempts are using vapes in the services. But if you look at the uh, yellow bars there, you can see that vapes when used in stop smoking services are associated um, with the highest success rate. So that's again consistent that vaping helps people to stop smoking. And I just looked at the North East compared with England and was surprised because the proportion of people vaping in the stop smoking services is a little bit lower here, 4.5% compared with 5.2% nationally. So perhaps that is something, um, it might have changed just recently from, from here, but perhaps that's something that could be looked at. And then uh, colleagues from UCL um, have also shown, um, and I know they're updating this at the moment, that they help tens of thousands of smokers each year to stop. Okay, so let's look at youth, which I'm sure you've been all waiting for. Um, so as you've seen in the ASH surveys data, in the last year, we saw a 50% increase in experimentation among 11 to 17 year olds. So that is uh, not a good thing. Um, when you look at current smoking and vaping, so the orange line here, uh, among the same age group, 11 to 17 year olds, um, current use did go up from 2021 to 2022, but it wasn't a significant change most recently. So hopefully um, we're uh, seeing that leveling off. Um, current smoking in their data has sort of hovered around, but seems to be now on a bit more of a downward decline. The, co the complication with these data is of course COVID and the impact that was having on young people. Um, I should say that there are other data among slightly older groups, so the ITC survey data, which have shown, shown some signs of increasing smoking. So we do need to be careful um, that with all the hype about vaping, we don't drive young people uh, to smoking. We are seeing uh, penetration among people who have never smoked. Most of it is experimental, thankfully. Uh, this slide shows current vaping among 11 to 17 year olds, again from ASH data, the orange line, and then again from ASH data, the blue line is adults. And you can see 2.3% in 2023 of never smokers uh, were vapors. So obviously that's not something um, we want to be seeing. And it's all associated, as you're very well aware, with disposable vapes, um, the Lost Marys, Elf Bars, etc., etc. And I suppose just one cautionary comment, I've said it already about um, smoking, but um, the top set of bars here, so this is from the 11 to 15 year old data, the top set of bars is uh, it's okay to try, the bottom set of bars is it's okay to use weekly, and this is what the young people were saying. If you were to rate these among young people, where would you put e-cigarettes? Um, for me, it's the, probably the least dangerous of all those things. Um, and as I think Ailsa said, why, why aren't we seeing, you know, headline news on alcohol and young people? So I think we, this isn't a, uh, what we want to be seeing, but let's try and keep it in proportion so we don't drive people to more harmful pursuits. I know I need to be moving on. I was also asked to cover whether we, um, uh, we want to be smoke-free or nicotine-free. So in summary, um, nicotine causes none or very little risk um, of the health 
impact of smoking. Um, it does cause addiction, but the addictiveness of nicotine depends on how it's delivered, its dose and what it comes with. Um, and we know that's hugely addictive in cigarette smoking. I think it is increasing with these latest uh, e-cigarettes we have on the market, which is of concern. And although uh, smokers talk about enjoying um, smoking and uh, getting positive effects from them with chronic smoking, it's difficult to separate what are the positive effects from the relief of withdrawal. My own view is that we should, um, to use catchphrases, uh, swap to stop or ditch or switch, you know, these sorts of things. If people are struggling to stop, and most smokers who are smoking today, let's face it, are struggling to stop because hopefully they do know about the dangers of smoking, we should be driving them down the nicotine harm continuum. This isn't to scale, uh, but e-cigarettes would be part of that. So for me, the key aim should be smoke-free, um, and let's not sort of make the and the perfect, the enemy of the good, um, by com putting confusing messages around nicotine-free, because that is not the dangerous component of cigarettes. And just to show this slide, if, I've, if I can, very, very briefly, it's among 15 to 24-year-olds in Europe, and the two countries on the left-hand side are those countries that have an alternative nicotine product. It's, it's banned here, it's snooze, but it shows that having an alternative product can drive smoking levels down with the right sort of regulatory uh, framework. So there is a precedent um, that it can be successful. So what's the best regulatory framework for vaping? It's one that maximises the benefits on the left-hand side and minimises the risks, which is of youth and never smoker uptake. And then there are other things about using regulated uh, vapes. But we can also do things to minimise the, the risks of vape products themselves, because you can take things out of vapes that you could never do with cigarettes um, smoke. And then we've talked about the four Ps. I've used the A's, which I think were in one of the ASH documents. These are the things that can tip the balance. You know, how affordable, they're cheap at the moment, too, too cheap. How appealing, they're attractive to young people. How accessible they are, they're available everywhere. So these are the levers we have. Addictiveness is a difficult one because smokers want to get that addictiveness, to get that satisfaction, otherwise they won't switch. So we have to get the balance right there. I also think we need to listen to people a bit more when we're talking about regulations. Let's understand the unintended consequences because there will be some of some of them. This is my list of what um, should be done, but obviously I've been very well informed by others in the area as well. I think we're all on the same page. We need to put them out behind the counter. We need to reduce the branded packaging. Our group has done work on that. We need to increase the price, reduce the social media um, uh, marketing of these things and increase enforcement. I would say we need more research and definitely we need this mass media that you were talking about in the last session. And these are all in line with the statement that you've got from the ADPHs in this, in this region as well that's in your packs. So I'm following them. How does vaping fit within the wider tobacco control context? This is my last couple of slides. You've seen this graph in many different ways. I've done a lot of work on people with mental health conditions. Um, so this just shows that um, people with mental health conditions are a long time before we help them to stop. My view is that we need to be going smoke-free for all, and that includes disadvantaged uh, groups. And as I said at the start, um, vaping seems to be an attractive product for many of these groups to help them to stop smoking, which should be the number one goal. So I'm going to leave you with my key messages. Uh, they're an effective tool to stop smoking and a less harmful form of nicotine delivery. I'm using the current CMO's um, statement because I can't put any better. If you don't smoke, don't vape. And we need to tighten up the regulatory framework and there are things that can be done now. We shouldn't be waiting. Um, we, can, we can see what's happening. And we need more money um, for enforcement, research, mass media campaigns, et cetera, et cetera. They're not a silver bullet. They're part of the toolkit that we have. Um, but I believe they will have an important role to play if effectively regulated uh, as we move and you move in this region towards your smoke-free 2030 targets. Thank you so much for listening.